We're going to go through Excel Power Query and uh, find out how to build some interesting dashboards and visuals um, within Excel itself. Um, kind of back to basics, I like to think today. Uh, I have a feeling a lot of people in the room have so much more knowledge than I have. Um, I am still learning myself. So if there's anything you want to chime in with, any questions along the way, uh, please feel free to, to jump right in, raise your hand, whatever you need to do. Um, first, just a quick outline of what we're going to move through. We have one hour. It's going to go by really fast. And I'm going to try not to be too overwhelming. Um, but it, it kind of is what it is so that you can keep on moving on to the, your next session. Um, so whenever I'm learning something new or whenever I'm at a conference like this, I kind of like to take a peek ahead to why we're here, what we're doing. Um, so I'm going to start out today by showing you the Excel uh, dashboard that I put together. Um, we're going to focus on two data sources uh, that are available on NYC Open Data. Uh, then we're going to rewind a little bit and go through a few of the, the tricks that I use when I'm getting started evaluating data. Can everyone hear me OK? Is it too loud? OK. Um, <laughs> then, uh, then we're going to jump into kind of a workshop type of setting. So as I'm saying all this, if you want to go to the session website and go ahead and download those uh, documents, you can do that. And then I'm hoping at the end we'll have maybe five or 10 minutes where we can ask questions or share ideas uh, or anything like that before you move on to your next, uh, your next information session. Before that, um, you're, you might be wondering, who the heck am I? And what credentials do I have to be standing here in front of you? And the answer is not very many. Um, but <laughs> I, uh, I do work for New York City Parks Department. Um, I'm not here on behalf of parks. But we are going to be looking at parks data. So I like to keep those lines nice and blurred for everybody. Um, but I, uh, I'm a playground safety inspector and also a, a data analyst uh, for the uh, borough of Brooklyn. Um, before I came to parks, I worked in the construction industry, uh, mostly in project management and cost estimation. Uh, I am a, a graduate of University of Buffalo. I studied civil engineering. Um, so basically, all of this is to say I don't have a structured uh, educational background in programming um, or in query languages. A lot of it has just been self-taught. Um, I like to think it's because I'm a lazy worker. <laughs> Any way that I can make my job easier with a macro um, or anything like that, I'm probably going to try to do that. Um, so I just I kind of wanted to uh, let you guys know who I am and where I'm at. Um, I'd also like to get to know all of you really, really quickly, because we don't have much time. So. <laughs> Everybody's favorite thing, an icebreaker. Um, for this, I'm going to have a series of questions on the next few slides. But basically, if you relate to the column on the left, you'll stay seated or keep your hand down. And if you relate to the one on the right, just raise your hand or wave your hand. Um, that way, I can get to know you all. And maybe you can get to know each other a little bit, too. And it's going to take less than a minute to do that. All right, are you a recreational data user or a professional data user? OK, awesome. Uh, do you eat ice cream in a cone or in a bowl? Maybe half up, half down. OK, all right. Any ice cream? Any ice cream anytime? Uh, Yankees or Mets? OK, good. Kind of 50-50 on that. Uh, French fries or onion rings? Onion rings, really? OK, all right. You guys can stay. Cats or dogs? A lot of dogs. It's New York City, a lot of dogs. Uh, early bird or night owl? OK, all my night owls. And do you hate icebreakers or love icebreakers? Wow, we've got some love for icebreakers. OK. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I, I just want to be able to like know you a little bit better. You know, the things that matter, like how you eat your ice cream. That's, that's what we need to know. Um, all right, so like I said, we're going to jump right into the final version of the tool uh, and uh, talk about um, how I connected those uh, to Excel. So let me open, uh, first of all, in the, so if you followed the link to the, uh, ex the uh, Google Drive document, you'll see Google Drive folder, you'll see two documents there. One is called start, one is end. The start one is the one that we're going to be using. The end is like the end product. Um, basically, depending on time, we're going to see how far we can move through things. So if we don't get all the way through, at least you have the final product for your use. Um, so I'm going to open the end. Uh, and then I just want to express that 
Um, we're using uh, Parks data, um, but a lot, the focus is really more on how to connect to any data source in uh, open data uh, and how to navigate it in Excel um, and bring in visuals and have them interact to each other. Uh, so the data sets that we're going to dive into um, is a, an inventory list. So basically, it shows all of the items that exist in all of our parks properties throughout the city. So you'll see this uh, column bar chart at the bottom here. Um, it shows just the various things that exist within parks. Um, we will also pull in uh, our all sites list, which has all of the uh, details about every property that is within parks jurisdiction uh, and what type of properties those are. Um, a few things to note, there's, if we had a little bit more time, we might go through and kind of translate some of those labels into something that's a little bit more public friendly. <laughs> um, so things like type one, you might not know what that is. It's a green street. So if we, you know, we're doing this for the prime time real deal, we could do like some translating to turn that type of data structure into something that's a little bit more digestible um, for the public. Uh, this side over here, we've got a, a few um, filter slicers, and these are linked to work with the whole uh, dashboard interface, um, as well as filters by specific boroughs. So when you click on um, the button, it's going to filter all everything. Did it filter? Great. Uh, to show just Queens, and then you could filter down to a specific zip code, and then you can see um, this kind of larger table at the bottom has a list of um, all of the properties in that zip code, which is apparently just a green street. Um, let's try another one. With the property name and all the features that are there. So if you wanted to see in your zip code where you have athletic fields, you could filter to just athletic fields and it'll tell you there's five of them, three of those have public restrooms, um, and w what the names of those properties are. Um, and that's kind of the, the end result, the main idea. Um, any questions so far before we kind of keep moving? Okay, so anytime that I'm um, well, working on a new dashboard, um, and anytime I'm working with a new data set, there's a few things that I'm definitely keeping in mind. Like what information is available? Um, is it, do I know that it's going to be accurate? Or what am I going to have to do to it in order to ensure that the information I'm giving to people um, is as accurate as possible? Uh, and then I think about what it is that I'm trying to explain and how I want people to be able to interact with it. And a lot of times, the way that I start out is by literally sketching, like drawing out what I want it, what I think I want it to look like, what types of visuals I want to have involved in it. And I'll keep like a list of what I know I can pull from the data sources and then some drawings of um, what I'm picturing, how it might, um, how it might flow and how everything is going to kind of fit together. Okay, and so let's just jump in um, to the start file. I'm gonna open that here. Did, uh, was everyone able to access it? Who wants to access it? Okay, I see some nodding, awesome. So when you open this up, you're gonna see it's like, you know, a similar structure to the end result, but it's down to bare bones. Um, I did load in one of the data sources just in the interest of time, but we're gonna load in one together. Also, if you get a, when you download it, if you get a warning that says that the, it doesn't trust the macros or something, you can just close that. It's a macro-enabled workbook, but there aren't any macros in it yet. We'll see if we have time to do that. Um, if you go to the links tab, you'll see um, I've just dropped in the hyperlinks for the two data sources that we're going to use. Um, before we do that, I'll just show you that the under data, hold on, I gotta move this. Um, if I go to data and then queries and connections, and let the queries pane load. You'll see I've already loaded in the all sites, which is the data source that has all of the details of um, every one of our properties, where it's located, how many acres it is, kind of all sorts of things. So the one that we're gonna practice loading in together is the inventory list. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and click on that link. All right, um, so like I said, whenever I'm using a data source, the first thing I'm checking is how accurate is this information? 
The first thing to note is that this data set hasn't been is was last updated in 2022. So um, we'll want to keep in mind that um, if there's brand new parks or properties that have been added to parks jurisdiction um, since 2022, they won't be reflected in this data source. Um, would that be an issue if this was real life? Uh, probably. <laughs> so we would want to um, keep that in mind like as we're navigating that and make sure that whatever it is we're trying to highlight, um, know that it comes with some caveats, which is kind of the situation whenever you're working with uh, data. Um, if you're probably all pretty familiar with navigating the open data website, but I'm going to go to the data button here, and it's going to give me a snapshot of what this uh, data, what this table looks like. So I've got some property IDs, um, all the features, and then the specific type um, of item that exists in each of the parks. Um, I'm going to go back to about, and there's a couple ways. Um, to do basically everything um, on open data. Um, if you go to actions, you'll be able to access the API endpoint. Um, but I'm going to go to export so that in the future, if you're ever working with another data set in open data, you can see that there's um, all sorts of file types that you can download this as. I'm going to click on API endpoint, and I'm going to use a CSV. So if you're following along, that was API endpoint CSV. And it tells us how many rows are in this table, which is 50, uh, almost 53,000 rows. And then you'll see this warning, which says that the limit is 1,000 rows. So that means if we were to just import this data into our Excel file, it's only going to bring in the first 1,000 rows. So there's just an extra step that we need to take in order to bring in all 52,000. I'm going to click on the copy to clipboard and then go back to my I'm going to close this one. Go back to my Excel sheet, and I'm still under data. And I, uh, again, like two ways to do this. We're, the, our data source is coming from the web. So I could click on from web, or I can go to get data. And you'll see all of the different ways that you can bring data into an Excel um, workbook. Uh, so under other sources, you'll also see from web. And I'm going to click on that. And then I'm just going to paste that link there. And then in order to change the limit, I'm just going to type a question mark a dollar sign, limit equals, and I'll put 55,000, because that's going to include all those other rows. It's, it'll make it's correct it instead of bringing in the default 1,000. All right, does that make sense? People who are, OK. <laughs> I'm going to click OK. OK, so it gives us another um, snapshot of what the table looks like, which is very similar to what we were able to see in open data. Um, you could, if you click the load button, what it's going to do is just dump that whole 53,000 rows um, into Excel, um, which I would prefer not to do, because that's kind of a lot of rows. Um, so instead, if you click the Transform Data button, it'll launch the Power Query Editor. And it shows us our table. Um, and uh, if you have a lot of people use Power Query a little bit before, a little bit, OK, cool. Um, I think it works kind of similarly to a lot of other um, not programmer friendly um, programs. Um, on this, on the right side here, you're going to see all of the steps that uh, have been applied to the data set. So if I click on source, it shows that I brought this in as a CSV web connection. You can see my limit has been set up. Um, it then, when it first came in, the first row was actually the headers. So it went ahead and uh, promoted the first row to be the title of all of my rows. Oh, sorry, columns. Um, and then it also changed. It said, uh, the Power Query said, I think that this is a number. So it changed the inventory ID from being a, um, a text into being a number. So that's all the things that it just did for us automatically. Um, if you wanted to delete a step at any time, so in the future, if you're playing around with Power Query and you set up a few things, um, you can't undo, like Control-Z, but you can just 
uh, delete it. So I just clicked the little X and it got rid of that step for me. And then if I was thinking, actually, I do want it to be a number, um, anytime you need to change your data type that's coming through, just click on that little square with the data type in it, and you can change it to whatever you need it to be. So I'll change it to a whole number, and then it put our change type back. Um, I'm also going to rename the, the query so that it's something that um, is going to be more straightforward for me. So I'm going to call this inventory because that's the name of the table. Um, and then bef if I were to trying to do um, any other kind of data cleaning on this, I could do it right in this interface before I load it into the Excel document. And there's all kinds of things that you can do. So for us today, we're keeping it really simple. Um, for now, I'm just going to leave it like this. And I'm going to go to close and load on the drop down and close and load to. And then it gives me a few options for where I want to load this. If I do table, it's just going to load my whole 53,000 rows. Um, if I want a pivot table, I could load it directly to a pivot table. I'm going to only create connection, and then I'm going to add it to the data model. And so that'll let me um, create pivot tables with it later on. And I'm going to click OK. And then it's uh, loading. OK, and then it loaded our 52,000 rows. Um, and we've got our PIP all sites already loaded. I do want to open this quickly out of practice so that we can check when was this last updated um, pretty recently uh, in uh, a couple weeks ago in 2024. If I take a look at what this data looks like, um, it's good news. I've got a prop ID, so I'm going to be able to match my prop IDs to prop IDs, and it'll tell me which borough and just like all kinds of information about the park. I'm going to go back to my Excel sheet uh, and open up. If you double click on the query under your queries and connections, it'll launch the query editor for you. OK. OK, so since I already loaded this in for us, um, if you take a look at the steps that I applied, going back to source, same situation. We loaded it as a web connection. Um, it promoted the headers. It made some changes. And then I also removed the columns that we didn't really need. So there's just tons of columns in this uh, data source. If you scroll all the way to the end, you'll see um, there's like which Senate uh, category, like all kinds of things um, that we just don't really need for our purposes. So anytime you want to remove columns, you can either remove the column that you have highlighted or you can remove all the other columns. So that's what I did. I just, I just selected the columns I wanted to keep and removed all the other ones. From here, we're going to take those two sources and combine them together into one table. Um, so I, all I have to do is right click under the queries section and go to new query, combine, and then merge queries. Sorry, that was kind of fast. <laughs> Let me do that again. Um, new query, combine, and then you'll see it says merge queries as new. And then it wants me to select my two queries that I want to merge into a new table. So I'm going to choose my inventory, and I'm going to choose my all sites. I've got the prop ID in both tables, so I just select prop ID and prop ID. And then there's a few different types of joins that we can use to combine these together. So if I do a left outer join, it's saying take everything from my inventory table and all of the things that match from my all sites table. For us, I'm going to use an inner join, which is basically, I think of it as like the Venn diagram. You're taking the stuff that overlaps. Um, and it'll tell us that we have, we're, we don't have all 52,000 rows that match from the inventory list, which is probably because things have changed over the years since 2022. But it's going to give us everything that does match. So I'm going to do an inner only matching rows uh, join. And I'm going to click OK. And then I'll just go ahead and rename the merge um, to be 
all sites inventory or whatever makes sense to me. And then you'll see that you can see all of the inventory uh, table and the last column here is showing the all sites uh, kind of like um, summarized as just its table and we want to expand that. So you're going to click on the two arrows button here and it gives you the list of all of the columns that exist within the all sites data. Um, and you could choose, like if you didn't need to bring in certain ones, you could unclick them. Um, we're going to bring in everything. And the default is to add the original table name as a, 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 at the beginning of the new column name. Um, I'm going to uncheck that just so that um, the column name isn't extremely long. Uh, and I'm going to click OK. OK, so then I have all of my details from the all sites um, brought into my inventory list. So now we know that B001 is American Playground and where it's located and everything like that. And I'm going to click the close and load and close and load two. And same thing, I'm only creating the connection and I'm adding it to the data model and clicking OK. Okay, and then it tells us that it was able to match up the 51, about 52,000 rows. Okay, is everyone doing okay so far? <laughs> All right. Um, so from here, we can start to build some of our pivot tables and charts um, and visuals and then link those together. Uh, so I'm going to jump right into that. Um, I'm going to go to insert on the pivot table. So usually if you just click pivot table, you would have a set of data selected and it would create that pivot table off of that table for you. When you click on the drop down, you'll see a few other options for creating a pivot table. And we're going to create our pivot table from the data model. And I want to put it in a new worksheet. So I'm going to click OK. Are people pretty familiar with pivot tables? Yeah. OK. I see some nods. Cool. Um, so basically, since we're using, we added all of our data sources to the data model, all three of those sources are showing up as options for us to build out a pivot table. Um, so I'm going to go to my all sites inventory. And then for my first visual, it was the donut chart that said that showed the total count of properties by borough. So I'm going to go to borough. Um, it shows it as an acronym, um, which if we have time, we would we could uh, update that to show it as the full name of the borough. Um, X is Bronx and R is Staten Island, uh, Richmond County. Um, so that's how those are showing up um, straight from the source. And then I'm going to click on prop ID and click it and drag it to the values. And then it, it's giving me a count of all those prop IDs. So important thing to note, our inventory list has multiple items for every prop ID. So that means the prop ID, one individual prop ID is showing up 20 times. So we need to change this to be a distinct count. So if you right click and go to summarize values, click distinct count, and then that's giving you the count of each unique prop ID instead of every single prop ID showing up every single time. Um, so from there, I'm going to go to Insert on the pie chart, drop down, and insert a donut. All right. Um, there's a few automatic uh, uh, formatting that shows up for us. I'm going to go ahead and hide. If I right click on this uh, button at the top of the pivot chart, um, I'm going to hide all my field buttons. Um, I'm going to delete my legend because I don't really want it. I'm going to delete my title too. And then just some really quick formatting. If I double click in the center of the chart and then click on the donut itself, I'm just going to edit. You can change the size of the hole in the center. And I'm going to change this to 60. Um, that way I can uh, change every, one, every chart that looks like this. I want it to look approximately the same. And then I'll do the same thing with the size. I'm just going to change the size to 3. Uh, by three. Okay, so then that's our first visual. I'm going to copy 
control C and paste it in my dashboard. And for now, I'm just going to put it somewhere like right here. Um, I'm going to change the name of my uh, sheet. So that is something that makes a little bit more sense to me. I'll call it prop count. I'm going to change the name of this pivot table as well because it's automatically called pivot table one. I'll call this prop count. And then I'm ready to make my next one. Um, we'll do some more formatting, like adding the data labels and that sort of stuff. But uh, that's kind of our initial step. My next um, count is the properties that have public restrooms. So I'm going to use this pivot table as my starting point to make that one. Um, so if you press Control on the keyboard and then click and drag the tab and drop it, um, it'll make a copy for you. And I'm going to rename this as PR count for public restroom. And then in my pivot table field list, I want to add that it has a public restroom as a filter. So I'm going to scroll down to public restroom, click and drag that to filters. And then in the drop down that shows up, I'll expand and click on yes and click OK. So now it's only showing the count of the properties that have a restroom. And then same thing, just going to copy and paste this right into this dashboard. All right, and then I'm going to um, make the bar chart now that shows us all of our properties by property type. So I'll go to uh, insert pivot table from data model. I want to put it in a new worksheet. I'm going to use all sites inventory again. And this time I want to see that it's coming through as subcategory one, which if we had some more time, we would make our data look all nice and clean. But in the interest of time, we're just going to kind of roll with that. So that's the one that's showing us what all of the different types of, of uh, the categories of parks properties that exist. Um, and then I'm going to use the same prop ID, drag it to my values so it gives me a count. And then I'm going to right click, summarize as a distinct count. OK, so then it's showing me just the totals um, for all of those items. Uh, I also want to have burrow, but I'm going to add it as a column. So I click on burrow and drag it to columns. And then it shows me the total counts um, broken out by each of uh, each of the burrows. Um, and then I'm going to go to insert. And I'll do a column chart, clustered column, so that it shows me um, each of the burrows and uh, by color uh, for which ones, uh, wh what the total counts for each of the park types. And I'm going to hide all my field buttons. And I'll just leave the legend there for a second. And then I'm going to put this over here. All right, and I will rename my sheet um, to category or something that makes sense. I will rename my pivot table to category. And then the other uh, bar or column chart that we had um, was the count of items by feature. Um, so we could do that the same way that we copied and pasted our donut chart by control, drag, and drop. Um, but uh, in the interest of time, um, I think we'll just leave that one out for now, and we'll see if we can circle back to it. Um, I want to add our de like our details pivot table, which was the table that showed the names of all the properties and where they're located. So I'm going to go to my dashboard tab and insert a pivot table. This time I'm going to insert it into the existing worksheet and put it right on um, this tab and click OK. And then I can't remember everything we had in there. It was burrow. We had maybe the category of park um, and the site name. So that'll tell us um, the specific name of that, of which site it is, and then what type it is. Um, and then we can edit what the layout of this uh, table looks like. So if you go to, when I'm clicked in the table, I'm going to go to design. And 
maybe a lot of people already know this, but you can edit like whether or not you want to show your totals um, and then how you want the report to be laid out. So I'm going to use the tabular form because um, I think it's a little bit easier to read. So then that shows me borough and then all my site names and then what types of sites they are. And we could add whatever other data we want there. Um, OK, so the next step, apart from kind of making everything look nicer, um, we're going to add the uh, slicers in. So whenever when I'm clicked either on a chart um, or on a, the pivot table, I can go to insert and then slicer. And it's going to show me all of the column uh, names that exist within that data source. And then I can choose which ones I want to be able to filter by. So from all sites inventory, I want to be able to filter by borough, um, by category, by feature, by type, and we'll do by zip code. And then I'll click OK, and it's going to drop in a bunch of these um, button filters for us. And then you can customize how these interact with each other and what they look like. So if you click on a slicer and you're in the slicer uh, uh, section on the ribbon, um, you can change the number of columns that it shows up in um, to make it uh, a little bit easier to fit onto the page. Um, you can go to slicer settings and have it hide the items that don't have any data. Uh, so I'm going to turn that on for that. And then if you go to report connections, you can tell it that you want it to be applied to all of your pivot tables. So if I click all those and click OK, then now this subcategory filter um, is going to be applied to all of these across the board. So I've got just the large parks all listed out. Um, whereas if I didn't do that, then for right now, it would only filter this table down here. So I'm just going to go through, starting with the zip code. I'm going to go to Report Connections and select each of my pivot tables and click OK. And then on my slicer settings, I wanted to hide the items that don't have um, any information. Going to repeat that for borough. And then, depending on how I want this to be laid out, um, just going to kind of put, uh, put my filters where I want them to end up approximately. So I'm going to drop them all over here, uh, add my columns, report connections. All right. And let's do one more. <laughs> All right. And then just like with anything in Excel, you can do um, uh, change the what th color theme you want it to be. You can um, uh, change what your slicer looks like specifically. So whenever I have one of these selected, you'll see that there's different styles that you can click through. So it just kind of depends on visually how you want this to look. Um, I'm going to move this over. OK, so then we've got a few visuals um, that interact with each other. And we would go through and just do some customizing to make it look like you know our what our end product is in mind um, since we do have a little are there any questions yet or comments okay everyone's so quiet I don't know um, since we do have uh, we're doing okay on time um, I want to jump back into my query so that I can we're doing okay on time right um, because I want to change the borough acronym to be the full name of the borough. So I'm just going to jump into that really quickly. Um, so I'm going to open my all sites inventory. And when I'm in add column, 
you'll see all sorts of different ways that you can create columns, new columns in your data set. So if for whatever reason you needed to make add in something that's not. Um, you can, if you needed to add a column that doesn't exist in your original source, you can add all sorts of different types of columns. We're going to add a conditional column, which is basically an if then statement. So I want to say, um, if we have the column burrow and it's a B, I want it to come up as Brooklyn instead of B. And I'm going to add another one, burrow, if it's M, then I want it to be Manhattan. Um, we don't have too many boroughs, so it wouldn't be crazy to have to do this one at a time. But sometimes if I'm doing this and it's like extremely repetitive like this, I'm going to click OK. I've only got Brooklyn and Manhattan in there so far. Um, and it's, yeah, just Brooklyn, Manhattan, or null. Um, but if I go to View and Advanced Editor, then it's, this is kind of like behind the scenes what, what Power Query is doing to your data. So it shows you the same as what your steps were applied, um, but just kind of uh, in a little bit more depth. Um, and I like to use this if I'm doing something where um, you know, I'm going to have to do it four or five more times. Then I might spread these out a little bit to make it easier for me to see. And then I'm just going to um, copy and paste this for my other boroughs, and then uh, edit these for Staten Island. Bronx, Queens, and then I'll do Q. I've got X, and I have R. And then I'm going to click Done. And now when I click the drop down for my burrow, it'll show me all of those written out for me. And I'm going to click OK. And then I want burrow to show up at the beginning of the table. So I'm just going to right click on the column and move it to the beginning. All right. And so all it did was reorder the columns for me. So if you wanted any of your columns to show up differently, you could just move them around in this step. And then sit, when you press Enter, it's going to have your table in whatever format you wanted. Um, so I'm going to go to Home and Close and Load. Uh, you can do it, Excel. OK. Um, then once it's loaded, uh, I'm going to open my go. I'm just going to go through my uh, donut charts quickly. And instead of using burrow, I'm going to just click and drag that, drop it off. I'm going to change this to burrow so that it shows me Brooklyn, Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, Staten Island. It doesn't change the totals, but it just uh, it should, does change the colors of the chart. Um, but yeah, that way it's in kind of a straightforward um, language for whoever's using it. Um, not burrow, but burrow. And then lastly, I've got my burrow as columns um, in this chart. OK, and then in the category, I think I will also, if you right click on any of the columns in your pivot chart and go to sort, you can sort this as largest to smallest. So that'll show you what is the uh, largest number um, of properties that you have. Um, and then I'm going to get rid of this uh, uh, slicer. And instead, oh, I forgot to edit this one. Um, I'm going to add the burrow instead. So I'll insert. What? Oh, slicer, and then um, burrow. OK. And then I'm going to do the report connections and just apply it to each of those. So that now, when I click on Brooklyn, um, it'll filter. it filters everything to just Brooklyn. Um, a few things that are kind of annoying about Excel um, that I haven't found a workaround for. So it's automatically applying the colors to all my charts. Um, I wanted them all to match my little map visual. So if you, if in the future you ever need to do that, the only way I've found to do it is to manually change 
the colors on the chart. So I would just go through um, and fill the chart with the color that I want. That way, when I click on queens, it's going to maintain that color for me. Um, so just one thing to note. And then I'm going to add, I could add some data labels so that it shows me all those counts to each of these. Um, and do we have time to do a macro? Uh, then the other thing I wanted was to be able, to, instead of having to interact with this slicer, I wanted people to be able to click on um, like the name of the borough on this uh, map visual in order to um, filter those. Does anybody use macros really or VBA? A little bit, a little bit. OK. Um, I'm going to go through it really quickly because we have a few minutes. Um, we have 20 minutes. We're so good. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, the way that I use macros or VBA is like really simple. Like I think that a lot. If I'm doing something that's extremely repetitive, then I'll like to create like a button that's just going to do that for me. So if you've never done that before um, in Excel, you need to add the developer tab to your ribbon. It's really easy to do that. Just right click on the ribbon and go to customize the ribbon. And then you'll see a checkbox next to developer. And just click on that and click OK. Then there's a shortcut, and it's just there um, if you want to create a macro or edit anything in VBA. Um, Excel has a neat feature where you can just record what you're doing and have it create a macro for you. So this is like so simple. All I'm going to do is click Record Macro. I'm going to call it Bronx and click OK. And then I'm going to click. It says it's recording. I'm going to click the Bronx button. And then I'm going to stop recording. Because all I want is for this text box to do that for me. Um, I'm going to click Record Macro again and call this one Clear and click OK. And then I'm going to click the Clear Filter button. And so then that takes away the filter that I had applied. Um, now when I right click on this Bronx text box, I will see the Assign Macro button here. And then I'm going to choose Bronx as the one that I want to apply to it. So now I click on this, and it just filters that for me. And then I have um, a reset icon. I'm going to assign the clear macro to that one so that when I click on this, it just clears that filter for me. So um, I'm going to open up my Bronx macro um, by clicking on macros and then um, click Edit on Bronx. And it'll show you basically what Excel captured that you did. So all we did was we activated the Bronx in the slicer. Um, so I'm going to delete some of this. And I'm just going to do the same thing, but for each of the other boroughs. Um, all right, and then I'm just going to call this one Brooklyn. And I wanted to choose Brooklyn and then Manhattan. This is where keeping those shorter acronyms would have come in handy. Manhattan, uh, we've got Queens. And last but longest, we have Staten Island. All right. And then when I close that, now I can right click on Manhattan, assign macro, and choose Manhattan. And then when I click on this, it's going to filter it to just Manhattan. Um, and then to be really sneaky, I can move my uh, slicer to another tab. That way I can delete it from my dashboard and make it look nicer. And then when I click on Manhattan, it's still going to filter to just Manhattan. Um, yeah, so apart from that, it's just a lot of uh, editing to how like what you want it to look like. Um, but all of the fundamental um, interactions are there uh, for however you want it to work. We can add in our um, 
totals by park feature. So I'll go to the copy that I made of category and rename this as feature. And then instead of subcategory, I'm going to delete that and put feature. So it shows me all of the total counts of athletic fields and everything else. And I'm just going to change borough to borough in the columns. And then paste this into my dashboard if I want to add that there. And yeah, then you could just keep like clicking through, keep making it look the way that you want to. For the um, end result that we took a look at at the beginning, um, I also added a few uh, text boxes. So these to kind of highlight the total of all the properties. Um, so that's just linked back to the property count page where it has the grand total. Um, I added, I added grid lines to the category uh, and um, feature so that you could see, like, see things a little bit better. Just small things like that, that it's really kind of up to how you want it to appear and how you want people to interact with it. So that then you could say, if you live in Brooklyn and you wanted to see um, just where you have paths, Right, is that one? Uh, trails. So if you wanted to see all of the properties where we have trails in Brooklyn, um, you could filter down to just that. Or maybe you want to see all of the places where we have basketball courts. Um, kind of just all sorts of things to click through. Um, yeah, I mean, we could keep working on building it, but I want to check to see if anybody has questions or comments. Yeah. Um, from. Uh, Open data? Yep. Yeah, definitely. Um, OK, so when I'm in Open Data Online, um, you're going to see, whether you're in the About or the Data column, it doesn't matter. You're going to see the Export button. And there's, like I was saying, so many different uh, file types that you can export to. For me, I like to use the API endpoint and export it as CSV. And then all I have to do is copy this a uh, URL to the clipboard. I go back to uh, Excel, go to data, get data, uh, or you could just click from web. Oh. Yeah, it's only in the Excel client, it looks like. Oh, OK, OK. Not in, no, not even not in 365? Yeah, I'm in, I'm in Excel 365 right now. The, uh, the online version doesn't have those with expanded queries. OK. OK, got it. Yeah, that's good to know. Yeah, and Matt also, I think you can get it uh, through a file with six queries. OK. Hmm, OK, yeah, I've never used Mac, so I wasn't sure about that. Um, but it does it, it works in kind of the standard desktop? OK, OK. Um, um, oh, like instead, yeah, so I guess if you're working in the, um, if you're working in uh, Excel 365 or on a Mac, then you could just download it as a CSV, yeah. is yeah, that? Okay. Um, Um, let me see. I'm just going to open the uh, CSV so that we can take a look at that. But it's in the Mac. If you open it as a CSV, can you? Do you have the get data? Do you have get data at all, or does it not show up at all? There's a get data, but it doesn't have the option from web. Oh, okay. All right. OK, so I guess what you could do then is download the CSVs. Um, and then you could get data, like in a, another um, Excel workbook, you can do, 
let me see. I just need to save this so that we can find it. We have 10 minutes left. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Yeah, so if you wanted to do it with CSV, um, you could go to act or export, download the file as a CSV. Um, and then in another Excel workbook, you can get data. It says this, right? Like from, you can do from file and then from text. Yeah. Okay, so it just doesn't have the from web. Okay. Sorry about that. I didn't realize that it doesn't do that. Um, yeah, so you could get it from text, and then you can choose like where you're getting, wherever, uh, if it's downloaded to, um, you can save it, uh, and then connect to Power Query from there. Um, let me just put it somewhere that makes... Any other, or I'm, I'm gonna, kind of show how to do that. But if there's any other questions or comments kind of while that's, yeah, go ahead. So when you move the, the parts that you've made in, in each individual tab to the export tab, when you're, how do you ensure that those are still tied to the parts on the actual tabs themselves? Um, so as long as you're making a copy of it and then paste, just kind of pasting it into the dashboard, it's always, that chart is always going to be linked back to its like parent pivot table. And so then anytime you apply a filter to that pivot table, it's going to affect the chart as well. Um, but as far as ensuring it, I think just like check to make sure that it did it. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, so as long as it's tied to the template. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. I was curious. If you shared, let's say you completed this, um, this dashboard and you shared it with an end user or some, someone who requested it. Mm -hmm. um, them this spreadsheet where they could change things around, or do you give them a, uh, some version where it's like, not fungible? So I, I guess it depends on who you're sharing it with. Um, so if you didn't want someone to have control over what's being changed, then I would like lock, kind of try to lock down the Excel sheet so that they they can't be moving things around. So um, I by uh, creating like a security. Um, like you can, you would save it so that it can't be edited. And then when you share it, they won't be able to like move anything. Um, but the other thing, so for Excel 365, so I've had to, I've like built a visual for someone and then had them use it just in Excel 365, which they're able to interact with the Power Query linked data, but you cannot use macros in Excel 365. So that's one thing to keep in mind if you're hoping to share it with other people and you know that they're going to be using it online, just don't use macros, but they'll be able to use like the uh, slicers and anything else. Um, so that's one thing to know. Yeah. Um, any other questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. So, as long as the rows don't go over 55,000 and you need to, then if it went over that quantity of rows, then you would need to edit the limit. But otherwise, when you go to data, queries and connections, you can refresh it by clicking the refresh button. Um, it should refresh also if you click refresh all. You could also make it so that it refreshes automatically every time you open the workbook. If you just want it to be like, every time I want it to refresh. Um, Oh, rather than the CSV? Right. right. Yes. OK, that's there a good. Because there are some other um, data sets that are just CSV. They don't have an API. OK, OK. So if you do the CSV, then you need to export a new CSV. Yeah, OK. Um, is there like a workaround for that, or is that kind of the best? The best OK, all right. Does that answer your question? OK. Any other questions? Yeah. Just going off what you said, um, how would you put an API um, if, if the uh, spreadsheet is going to be a CSV? 
Um, so if there's the API available, then just when you go to export, instead of downloading the file as whatever, you would do it as the API endpoint. Oh, that's okay. And it's like, it's under, oh, sorry. It's under actions as well. You'll see API there too. All right. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Um, Oh, let's see. I, w I just want to try to get the. Uh, so if we were if we were um, a little more limited and we wanted to be able to import the CSV, um, so I would go to get data and I could do it from file. This is actually how I first started using Power Query was because I had a bunch of the same Excel files that I wanted to put in a folder and then load them all into one table. So if you have um, like multiple uh, Excel files that are similar, you can drop them into one folder location and you can load in that whole folder. So that's an option from folder or you can do a specific Excel workbook or the text or CSV. So I saved that all sites here and I'm gonna click, select it and then click import. And then it'll show me the snapshot of what that data looks like, and then I would click transform data. And then it has my steps on the side and every, you know, all of the other set, like same information as what we use for the API endpoint. Um, and then I could click, if I click close and load, it's just going to load the whole table for me, or I could close and load to and load it maybe just as a pivot table and then it just automatically jumps into the pivot table field and I could click on um, all of the property names um, and whatever else, the borough, how many acres it is. If you wanted to see like which borough has the largest acres of parks, um, things like that. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, so whichever method you use to bring it into Excel is going to be the same. So um, when you have your queries uh, set up on the left side here, if you right click and go to new query, combine, and then merge queries, oops, uh, merge queries as new, um, then you would select which ones you want to merge. So if you wanted to do the inventory and all sites. And then you need to have like a common uh, identifier between the two so that they overlap with each other. So for us, it's prop ID. I would choose those. And then you would choose which type of join you want to use. And then click OK. And then it makes the new table for you. And then the last step is to expand whichever columns you want to include from the previous um, uh, for, from the second table. So if you only need to include the site name, then you could just click site name and click OK, and then it's going to bring in just the site name or whatever else you need. Does that help? OK. One minute left. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Oh. Um, for uh, like, so I have my table in Power Query and now I want to put it into my the Excel workbook. Okay, so I would go to, if I click close and load, it's just gonna, it'll load the whole table, which we could do that. Um, I'll just click that. It says it's getting the data, it's loading for us. Um, hopefully it won't take too long. Yeah, so there it goes. Okay, so it just brought in that whole table for us. Um, if you wanted to keep it just as a connection, then you would click close and load and connection only. And anytime you need to, if you want to change that, um, then open your queries and connections page. If you, hold on, sorry. If you right click, you can go to load to and then only create connection, or this is the same import data that we've been seeing. 
you could add it to the data model, whatever you need to do, and click OK. And it'll do change, change the way that you're loading it for you. Does that help? OK. All right, we're all out of time. Thank you all so much for being here.